you know, I, it's true that revolutions come in waves. And I'm a more old man, but I participated already in three waves of revolution. Because the first in my childhood was the revolution of 1956, of workers' councils against Hungary, against the communist tyranny, which was really, as we now know, a form of bureaucratic capitalism. And the idea that people would organize against communism in the name of Soviets, that is to say workers' councils, was a new idea in 1956 because it made us realize that it was really one world. And then 68 came along, and I was active in the occupations that took place at the university where I was teaching, Columbia and New York, and then came over to France and so on. This was a worldwide revolution. And since then, we've had a wave of revolutions in Southeast Asia, a wave of revolutions in Latin America, and of course the most recent one is the one that happened here in the uh, Arab Spring. But now, I know that a lot of people are feeling disappointed because the Arab Spring, uh, although it spread a lot, and inspired revolts and uh, it's hit in Europe, even in the United States, where they took over the state house of Wisconsin, and where I was able to say that uh, the Arabs have taught democracy to the Americans instead of the other way around. But now we're in the part, a wave goes up, and now we're in this part of the wave. And a lot of people are discouraged. But we must celebrate the victory of Tunisia and a partial victory in Morocco. Because we're here now. <laughs> and the idea that we get together and plan for future revolutions here in Tunisia. A terrible dictatorship of torture and so on. No, it has to go all the way. Although I was brought here by a taxi driver and I asked him what his profession was. And he said that he was a policeman, a part of the CRS, that's the anti-riot police. And he said he quit in 1912. I asked him why. He said he was against torture. So you see, something fundamental has changed. People change. And of course, the old forms of, of, of organization, the authorities, sneak back in. They call themselves different things. They paint themselves Democrats of one thing or the other because they sneak back into power. And the, it seems that the people are smiling, but it's not true. So what I, my first message is that don't get discouraged. All revolutions are doomed to failure, except the last one. Okay, now the last one has got to be, I think we all agree on this in a minute, worldwide. As long as the capitalists have a base in order to organize armed counter revolution, as long as the military power of the United States, in particular, uh, maintains itself everywhere, clearly, we're not going to find it. The internet, on the other hand, the World Wide Web, to be specific, is a form of organization which permits the 99% of the people of the world, that is to say, the 8 billion, to overthrow a regime of 400 because that's what the economists tell us. Half the world is owned by 400 billionaires. So it's billions versus billionaires. Now what I want to do in the few minutes that I've got your attention is to review the history of revolutions from the beginning in terms of communications technology, because that's our subject, internet revolution, okay? The first great revolution was the revolt of Spartacus and the slaves in ancient Rome. They were tough. They took over about a third of Italy. They beat the Roman legions that had beaten every professional army of every other empire in the world. But eventually they were crushed. Why? The Romans had Roman roads. They had a network. They had a communications network. And on those Roman roads that they built everywhere they conquered, they rushed in troops from North Africa, from Spain, and from other parts of their empire. Eventually, they were able to crush and crucify all of these revolted slaves. Okay? 
So we now know that the network is very, very important. Let's jump ahead now to the 18th century. Uh, uh, the, the 18th century was a great time of democratic revolutions. The first republic in the United States, and then the second one in France 10 years later. How did they get organized? In both cases, they had committees of correspondence. That is to say, the roads, the post office, and so on, enabled people to correspond so that they knew what was happening in every part of the country, and the revolutionaries could get together communications technology. Better still than that, they had presses that they could use. And so Thomas Paine in the United States, whose slogan was, the world is my country, wrote common sense. And it turns out that every person in the United States above the 18, age of 18, either read it or heard it read. Because everybody doesn't have to be literate, not only do, and everybody doesn't have to have a computer to, for the message to get around. The same in France. You had Marat, a friend of the people, and his, his blogs made governments fall and, and reputations and so on. So that's a great step in technology. Of a Europe-wide revolution. In that revolution came forward the slogan, working people of all lands unite. Of all lands. And they formed the organization called the International. Actually, that was formed a little bit before. And the International was a way that people all over the world could confederate and send delegates and organized together to support each other's strikes. And the first worldwide strike was for the eight-hour day, something that we lost in most of the countries of the world because these struggles have to be fought and then fought again and then fought again. And because as long as capital remains centralized and able to dominate, there's no way for victories to be too permanent. OK, now let's move forward to the big era of international socialism with thousands of newspapers and so on all over. But something else appeared on the world, and that was a, a, a broadcasting. Okay? The 20th century is the century of totalitarianism. It's the century of hierarchical, top-down broadcasting. Instead of all the little radio stations that began to spring up in the 20s, they organized them into networks, made top-down networks, like the CBS network and so on. But of course, in Germany and Russia, it was just the government and the network. And so it was one voice, Hitler's voice, Churchill's voice, Roosevelt's voice, De Gaulle's voice, Stalin's voice, beaming down. And everybody was like, Orwell's 1984, where actually they still have that in China, televisions that look back. So that if you're a teacher in a room in China, the authorities know what you're telling the students. So broadcasting was definitely not a step forward for organizing revolution and the different. But now we have something to do. And that is the internet. The internet, the net tells us all about it. It's, it, 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 it's like the, the, the women's tradition of networks of the quilts that, that are made. It's a, a way that is bottom-up, that is fundamentally democratic, uh, that enables people as equals to come together, to share information, to make decisions, and to act together in real time. And that's exactly what happened with C. Uh, uh, Aaron Now, around 1987, I developed a theory Everybody was saying, another world is possible. Now, I'm an old man and I'm also an historian. And I was asking the question, is another world really possible? How much time do we have? The capitalist world is like a ship, okay? And in this ship, the dictators and the billionaires have taken over the bridge. And it just, they're, they're not interested in steering it, they're steering it straight onto the rocks of total destruction through the ecology, through the weather destroying uh, and the governments that are becoming so security conscious that fear for freedom is, is, is crushed, and, and wars that are taking place all over and being financed and everywhere and so on. Uh, very clearly, that if we can keep on going this way, uh, uh, this, this, <laughs> but a lot of you will not be 
able to uh, live to be my age. And uh, I would bet that uh, 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 we have, I'm an optimist, I would give us one chance in a hundred to survive this hellish uh, century that has started in so many wars. Okay? Now, if there is one chance in a hundred, what is it? Okay. On this ship, which we call planet Earth, spaceship Earth, the workers, their families, the crew, are all down below decks. They're all sealed into compartments called uh, nationality and religions and all these different ways that the, 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 the bosses on top keep us separated. And uh, meanwhile, they're not steering the ship. They're busy pillaging all the stuff that's on board and eating it because they know there's going to be no tomorrow. Now, how can we all get together and storm the bridge, swarm them, throw them overboard, and get the ship back on course? Well, they say that Archimedes, that wonderful old philosopher, had a theory. It was a thought experiment. I'd like you to join me in a thought experiment. He says, if you give me a lever long enough, okay, and a fulcrum for me to balance it on, and a place to stand, I can lift the world. Well, you know that's theoretically possible. If there were a lever that could be that long, and if there were a place to stand. Now, in our case of trying to swarm the bridge of spaceship Earth and take over, we have those things. The lever is international <laughs> solidarity. But it has to be long enough to include the, the working people of all countries, okay? Now, we also have a fulcrum. And that fulcrum I'm going to call planetary consciousness. Now, I don't mean anything too big as, uh, and philosophical about it on the first level. Planetary consciousness is simply this. We all know that we live on a planet. When I was growing up, that's before World War II, 90% of the people did not know that the Earth was a planet. Most of the people didn't even know that there was much beyond the next village. And I'm talking about France, where people went to the next village to find a husband or a wife. And Paris was something that was, uh, that who called you up and made you pay taxes, okay? But when we talk about all the countries in Asia and Africa and Latin America, most of the people had never heard of the other countries, had never heard of the world, until World War II. And then suddenly there were GIs everywhere, and Japanese swarming over Asia, and so on. Airplanes coming in, and a little later, radios and transistor radios. And suddenly everybody knew, because it wasn't World War, wait a minute, there's something big out there, and it's nasty. Because the big news was Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So the very people, the billions at that time, there were only 300, three uh, uh, billion of us then, we discovered that at the one and the same time that there is a world, that we live on it, and that they can destroy it. They can blow it up. Right? So that is what I call planetary consciousness. So you can make it nice and mystical and that the world is the absolute and it's the only thing we have and there is no planet B and that we love it and so on. And I think all of that is true. But I'm not talking idealism here. I'm simply talking facts. We now live in one world and everybody knows it and everybody that isn't looking away knows that the only solution to the problems will be a global, a planetary solution. Now, fortunately, we have the platform. For the first time, we have a place to stand. Now, in the earlier days, when there were steamships and airplanes, people could get together for meetings like this and so on. But now we can communicate, and we can organize such meetings by the internet. Now, with the social media that made this Arab Spring flash across North Africa and then across the Mediterranean and then over to the United States and so on, there's no reason why this couldn't happen next Thursday and become worldwide. Who knows what horrible incident on the planet and what horrible thing of a, of, of a political repression could get people to come out into the streets.
communicate with each other. And so we, there is an answer to the question. Yes, another world is possible. But it can only be possible when it comes from the bottom up and when the 99% move together. And when I say the 99%, the majority in that are the women of the world. They are the ones that do, you talk about the labor movement, and that's where I come from, women do most of the work in the world. I'm talking about the work that's either paid for or in the informal sector, okay? They feed the world in most of the third world, and they do a lot of the work in the factories. And then they come home and they reproduce the family, which is what the capitalists do up as labor, to make more profits. So it has to be a worldwide revolution. It has to be a revolution where women's rights come before the revolutions and not as something that is promised afterwards and never comes. So the answer is yes, but the chances are slim. So what we need to ask ourselves is how can we better use the internet, which is a weapon that was created, yes I know, partly by the military, and it's used to spy on us and so on, but you know something, the hill we spied on us. When I was young, they opened my mail and they listened to my telephone conversations. So, and what I love about it is that they have a bidding call to no one who speaks Arabic in the CIA. So let them keep collecting the data. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>